Hey, do badders, welcome to Bad Boy Running. We've got an absolute treat for you because uh, G, this, I know what, our next guest, I won't reveal who it is yet, although you probably know already from the title. Um, I met on the Golden Trail series and um, not only was she doing incredible things, racing trail across Europe, but actually during the course of my research, I've discovered that she was formerly five times world orienteering champion, something we've never really talked about before. And I was, I've been really amazed in this past year having spoken to her, 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 her um, husband, who's also an orienteer, uh, Frederick Chanchand, who's uh, Gold Trail, just how strong and different the community is in Europe to the UK. So I wanted to get Judith on to talk about all orienteering things and then her career afterwards and life in general. So welcome to the podcast, the lovely Judith Weider. <laughs> how you doing? Thanks, I'm fine. Well, actually, before we go into our interior, I would love to hear from someone from Switzerland, like your take on how Switzerland works, because until um, you, you've, you've got the three different languages, then there's a fourth language. And, and I right, Roberto, who we met from the Golden Trail, I had no idea he was Swiss. I just assumed he was Italian for about five months because he acted Italian, he looked Italian, he spoke Italian-esque, but like, how, how does Switzerland work? So, <laughs> yeah, how does Switzerland work? It's, uh, we have actually four languages, so it's really complicated. But anyway, we have to learn the languages somehow. And I think we're really used to have different languages in Switzerland. So it works quite well. Um, German, the language I'm speaking is the biggest, like in cities and country-wise. So I'm quite lucky because many of all Swiss inhabitants, they speak German, so yeah. But then on the other hand, like Switzerland is really strict, like quite boring sometimes too. Um, you know what you have to do and <laughs> when you have to work. And that makes it maybe also easier to deal with so many languages too, because just it's the people, how they are and how they react and how they work. And do, do most people within Switzerland know French and German? Or so, is it or yes French and, and Italian no. or French and is it Swiss, the local language? Or is it Canton, I think, or something? Do something you like? really want me to explain that? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is educational <laughs> for so the listeners school, as well. <laughs> exactly. So at school, you normally have like your first language. So which for me is German. At fifth grade, back when I went to school, I started learning French. At seventh grade, we started to learn English and Italian for me, because I've cho chosen to speak or to learn Italian. So for a French speaking per a Swiss person, it would be the opposite. So they have first French and then I start German and English. But sometimes it also changes because they live in a part where they already speak two languages. So they would have both of them at school or like where they live. So. It's really complicated. All should somehow learn French or German, probably also English. But um, yeah, it makes it complicated and it's better to know as many languages as possible. And then you will make your way through Switzerland. And do because in, in the UK, for example, there's, there's quite a strong identity split between the North and the South. So if you meet uh, people from the South, like Jodie and I, we're sophisticated gentlemen, you know, very <laughs> suave, uh, well-educated, humorous, attractive. You go up north and it, it seems like it rains the whole time and they're um, a lot more friendly, but um, also a lot more angry, mainly about the south because of the views I've just said. So um, how, how does it work in Switzerland? Are the, do, do French people, do, do the French Swiss and the German Swiss tend to socialize amongst themselves and if you met someone who was like a, a french swiss would you almost consider them slightly different as a as a person as an identity from if you met someone in a french area who was a german swiss yes i mean the mentality is quite different um especially the french and the italian they are different than the german speaking and then the uh, Retro-Romanish, it's the fourth language, it's a really small one. So this is like really hard to tell. They probably are quite similar than the Italian speaking people. But anyway, um, 
some people would say, like the Swiss German people, sometimes say they would be like Italian people, like the Italian speaking Swiss people. But when you ask they, them, they would say they are Swiss. So it makes it like it, they are a bit in between and it makes it so diverse. So it makes it also really nice for us going to Ticino, to the Italian part, to really be kind of in holidays, but it's still not another country. So yeah, it is different. It's more like flexible. The German part is really strict. It's like you have to really be on time. You have to do your job. French speaking and Italian part, it would be like more a bit, yeah, we do it somehow. We come later maybe. And it's like more chilled. And also, if we come back to trail running or orienteering, for example, in the French speaking part, trail running is way bigger than in German part. So for example, also Mark Lauenstein, for example, he mm. is living in a French part of Switzerland. There trail running is way bigger. And it's like for us sometimes, yeah, also a pity because we would like to have the community as big as it is there. And, and you, that's a good segue, by the way, that was, that was better than the segues <laughs> we normally do between topics. Um, and would, would you say that, say the, is that because of the the, the geography that the trail running is bigger in the French part because they're in more mountainous areas or is it just cultural like it, is it even split on the hills no it's not because of the mountains because for example where I live the mountains are beautiful or close to us they're really beautiful it's not really that it's more the culture the community Probably also because France is quite close, which is like really big. Ansi, for example, which is already mm. like the bigger trail running community there. It is really close to the French part of Switzerland. So I think it's more about that. And of course, it is nice to go running in the hills there, but it's more like rolling hills than like the steep, steep mountains. So, so then when did you first get into orienteering then? Yeah, orienteering is a family sport, you would say. Um, my parents introduced me to orienteering as a really small kid, probably even before I started to walk. They did it, both of them. And um, yeah, I started to just go there with them, enjoying like time in the forest or around the forest. At the age of seven, I started to do my first orienteering by myself, all alone in the forest. So quite early, if I think about that now, but um, yeah, it was fun and it was like more fun to just meet people or girls and boys for me back then um, to have fun with them after or before the race would start than really going for a competition. And, and how hard would say, say we took a seven year old to do orienteering? What kind of distances would they be running and how hard are the routes to navigate and the maps to read? Yeah, so the difficulty would for sure be different than for the elite runners. So normally you would say they walk or run along path. They have like um, sometimes also marked um, like shields in the forest to really help navigate. Um, to make it easy and not, you want to, don't want to lose a kid. So normally orienteering is kind of <laughs> like you have to navigate by yourself from mm. control A to B as fast as possible along a marked route, which is like, or a drawn route on your map, which you have to follow. So the challenge is to find your fastest route along these controls, the, the fastest that wins. You con the controls, you will punch them electronically. So um, it's like not like before when you just have to punch them by like really old holes in your map or kind of things like really special things. Now it's electronical and you really, it goes, everything is like fast. And as a kid, it's like almost the most fun is like to, to punch the controls. And um, therefore, they put quite <laughs> many controls as a, on a kid's um, track, and it would be maybe two kilometers or three kilometers for the bigger ones. Um, but um, yeah, it should not be too long to not lose the motivation and the fun part of it. And does that ever happen? Do kids ever just you know, get missing for days at a time, <laughs> end up living with wolves? And <laughs> no, not what I've heard actually. But um, probably they got lost. Yeah. 
but luckily or like the you you never want kids to get loose lost so normally in an orienteering competition you have many people in the forest and all adults would help the kids if they look a bit lost and like if they ask you so everybody would stop and tell them where to go or even mm. bring them to their next control to really make it like fun for them and not to lose someone um but of course also me myself i lost myself sometimes not like too big but it took some time till i got back or had some yeah not so nice moments but actually i can't remember many of these moments because it's like you lose these memories quite fast, I think, and you mm. remember the ones which were fun. So, and do they? Well, you said a, it was a, a family sport, whether. and so does that mean that when these courses are, um, they're either specifically for for children and the sort of the children on it, or everyone runs it, but everyone does a different course. It, how how is it kind of split? Is it just a, a a full family event just with different controls for 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 different age groups? No, exactly. So you normally have the same start and finish. And then the course itself, it's different for every category, which is like, for example, woman 10, like the 10 year olds. And then yeah. it could be like woman 35 or like the 35 year olds and maybe men 80 or 85, which is the oldest sometimes like, or there's sometimes exactly. even age, um, 90 i think that's the oldest category which is on really? the on they the have really screen. big maps because of bad eyesight <laughs> but they do actually have almost the same maps so they're quite <laughs> they're just like amazing um they use glasses from time to time but like they're really good so of course the difficulties goes like from really easy to difficult and back to easier in case mm. also being in the terrain of course it gets harder when you get older so there is a person who sets these courses, who put out the controls, and then people would start the race. And and the kids when they when they're running this, and say a young child gets lost, how do they typically react? Is it is it fear? Is it frustration? Is it anger? Like because I'm trying to think about if I was seven or, or seven year olds I know, like what would your daughter do, JD? Um, just she trying to get in the, the headspace of. I just the the idea of so my, you mean, uh, my daughter you know, if doing you have a seven year old kid yeah but it will not be that your daughter will just get thrown into the forest having a map the first time in her hand for her life like you would oh, go uh, have i done it wrong oh no <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, you go and walk with her first maybe run together and show her the map how the map works so she will find like that she is a little bit used to being in a in the forest and like knows what to do when she is like unsure kind of so if they're like really good prepared it's no problem and i promise you they will like find it easy so also for example in switzerland kids do have to do orienteering at school oh wow because really you still think it's like really important to be able to read a map so it's a part of the school sports system um so every school should do orienteering at some point does that make it less cool <laughs> but like does that mean because if you're if you have to do something at school then that almost taints the joy of it surely yep so you know school <laughs> orienteering at school for myself i hated it it like was really frustrating for, us, for yeah. me to do it. Yeah, no, it was really not the time of my life. But I think it's still good to do it because you need to be able to read a map also for other sports or if you go hike in the mountains, it's quite nice if you know how the map is and how you read a map. So. And do you, do you find that the distraction of the map reading and the going to checkpoints helps children run further than they would have done if they didn't have that as a, a distraction. So probably yes. Um, it depends, of course. If they don't like running, it will not help. But if mm. they like like doing something else beside running, yes. And 
I mean, I know many kids like the challenge of knowing, like the game kind of thing. So it's almost like mm. you can be happy every time you reach a control. You're like, mm. whoa, yeah, I made it. <laughs> and now the next one. And it's like a nice feeling every time you get to a control point by like no mistake and just as fast as possible. So it's quite fun. I think I think it is David. David, I think because I've um, I've done orienteering with my daughter, um, yeah. not for, like proper competition or anything, but we have um, some permanent courses at various places. Not not a huge amount, but various places in you know locally. And there's there's like two types of of courses. There's ones that are um, either on a sort of a country park which are well maintained, mm. and you kind of buy a map and then and then you do it. And and then there's ones that in public places where all the controls are completely vandalised and smashed <laughs> up and you know just there's uh, muggers uh, waiting you, to you, take you're, your phone. You're, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. You're wandering around trying to look for controls that that, that have gone ten years ago. But <laughs> but the, but the thing is, when we when we did it the when I did it the first time with her, because um, she kind of wasn't she didn't know what to expect, and it did mm. force her to read a map. And it did force her to kind of think about the distance she was traveling. And she ran, I think she ran about five kilometers or something that day, which is the furthest she'd ever run. And mm. she didn't think about it at all. So it, she, and she absolutely loved it, but just the whole, just getting into orienteering is, I think mm. it's, it, cause it's quite, uh, quite an unusual community in the sense that it's not as big as, you know, like you say, trail running or anything else. Like it, and you know, trying to find them online isn't mm. particularly easy as well. So <laughs> it's just to find. <laughs> weirdly, well, that's ironically. <laughs> but weird, yeah, exactly. No, that's it. You have to work really hard. <laughs> but yeah, so I, don't I think, know I think how it is in UK, but actually, normally they're like clubs which have like internet platforms. You could contact them. Um, mm. it, in in Switzerland, there is like the Swiss Orienteering Federation. So I know that there is also the British Orienteering Federation. You could contact to get to know the closest. Um, club which often also do kids trainings for example um actually in my club here at home they have like 20 to 50 kids every wednesday on our orienteering training which is like huge wow. but it's like yeah. just because they have wow. fun together it's just like it has grown in the last latest years but it's just like because they tell at school oh we have nice like afternoon come and join us and then it like starts growing so I think it's that way. You have really to contact the clubs and to ask them for like where to go and how to do it. Because otherwise, yeah, as you said, it's not just going out doing a run on trail, uh, like on a trail. Mm. It's like you need to have someone who prepares courses or puts mm. out nice controls, which are not taken away and like, <laughs> yeah, made for years. Because also the maps, they change like quite much when forest work is done and like everything so they have to renew everything all the time it makes it even harder for orienteering club to be act, act, um, really good prepared for races or trainings and so on so so you you mentioned then that you when you were at school you didn't really like orienteering because of the i guess the relationship between school and an activity when did you start to realize you're good and when did you actually start to get a passion for it then so I was actually liking orienteering, like the racing or the competition things also while doing it at school. So as I was introduced to orienteering as a seven year old kid or even earlier, I started to like it kind of, it was our weekend activity, but it was more like the friends I had, which made it fun for me. So we had like a regional national team kind of like or not national but like regional team to yeah. um, with training camps and weekends and made it so much fun to just join them and um yeah but really to start focusing on orienteering i didn't start before the age of 20 actually i was running internationally before that from the age of 16 but I was always doing other sports, other activities. So it was never like the only focus I had. And and when you, is, is did you change because at that age it could suddenly become a full-time career? Or was it more that you just had a passion or that you needed to focus more to, to, to be competitive? Yeah, it was more because I was um, doing ballet. I was doing... Um, ski orienteering, cross-country skiing, 
I was playing the violin. I was like doing so many different things and started to study physiotherapy. So, I mean, you can't do everything. You can do a lot, but like not everything if you want to get like really in a good, uh, yeah, if you want to compete too, because weekends were like quite occupied. So because of that, I, of course, I started to focus on engineering just like to to have a bit more focus on that. But I never was like whole time or in tier two. I was always studying or working beside because you, as you heard, I was always doing a lot. I couldn't just yeah. swap to just orienteering. And, and what is orienteering training then? Because obviously being fast is useful, but it, it really strikes me having seen you and Fred run that you you guys can run on terrain without almost thinking about what what's beneath your feet in a way that other runners can't and you also then have the navigation element as well on the run so like how how would you typically spend a week training what would you focus on so the most the biggest focus is running um, it could be running on asphalt or on gravel roads trails close to where you live um, our interiors do run about 80 to 150 kilometers a week mm. uh, with, of course, also uphill meters. Um, they do normal intervals on track, for example, too, because our interior isn't just in the forest. There is also the sprint, which is mostly in the city. So you need to be fast, too. They do also two to three trainings per week in strength, like in a fitness center to do right like, really strength training. and. In Switzerland, you, it's really hard to do a lot of orienteering training during weeks times because it's like you have to travel quite far to get nice forests. Mm. So normally they do like one orienteering training every week, which is like really little. If you compare to Sweden, for example, they would do like 80% of their training as an orienteering training with a coach putting out the controls, doing the track, like the, the course and then them running. So it's a bit different where you are living. Yeah. Swiss people do focus more on the running and then they go to training camps where they would do two or three orienteering trainings every day to really focus just on the orienteering part. And, and can you tell that when in the competitions? Can you see that there are some courses that favor the Swiss who may be faster, fitter and some which a heavy te heavily technical that the, the Swedish will do better in or, or does it all work itself and even itself out? No, definitely. I mean, for example, myself, I was living in Sweden for eight months to prepare for the World Championships in Sweden. So it shows you how much as a Swiss I needed to really do more training than they would do like for in this terrain. And then if they compete in Switzerland, for example, where it's more runnable, where it's more um, hard ground, for example, they would probably not be the best if they don't train it. So mm. that's why I was traveling quite a lot as an orienteer too, and which made it really hard to really focus on everything. But yeah, it's really definitely like that, that you have your strength, you have like the things which you can do more better or not. And then um, probably you have to think if you want to change that and train in this kind of terrain then. How and does the, how does it split in terms of the, uh, the, the, the kind of like the ability that you need? Like, is it sort of like 80% the, you know, the running, the speed of the running, the endurance and everything. And like 20% in terms of being able to do the navigation and be able to think quickly. And how, how does how is it split in terms of between physical ability and, and you know, using your, your mental ability? If you talk about a hobby athlete, it could probably be like that. But as an elite orienteer, it would be 50 50 because mm -hmm. it's kind of if you're not good at navigating, you will never get world champ. If you're not fast running, you will never be the best one. Mm -hmm. So it really has to be this 50 50 to, to go together. And of course, some athletes would be a bit stronger in running and some would be a bit fast, uh, stronger in navigating. But now, since the since a top orienteer is really fast, also on the track, for example, on five thousand meter, it's really 
they have to do both and they have to do the job in both sides. So yeah, I would say it's 50, 50 and, um, yeah, it's really important to train both. And then, so how, how else, how else do you train that then in terms of like your, you know, your navigation skills? Is it just doing, doing more of it or all of that other drills, exercises and things like that that you can do? So the orienteering, you could train, um, also just on paper. Um, you look at the map and you draw your routes yourself or your courses and um, you think what the course would do maybe too and you just like really boring job. I was never good at that. I'm more the one just enjoying going out and doing doing what I like to. So yeah. for me it was more doing more on doing trainings and then for example you have like Normally you have a map with everything on. So for example, you would have like every little street, every little um, dense forest, for example, on the map. Um, sometimes you take things from the map. For example, you take out the, you will take the, delete the, the path, for example. So you navigate without path on the map. Wow. So it makes it even harder to, to read the map, to navigate to the controls, to go through straight through the forest. And it helps you to really get better at navigating. So the course setter always thinks about different types of trainings. So it's not just running a course. Sometimes it's, as I said, the path. Sometimes they will do like white parts of the map. Like they take just a map away to force you running just by compass, for example, and they, <laughs> it's really fun. complicated everything. So yeah, it's a big work to prepare trainings for an orienteer. And what would you say, what are the choices when you're navigating? Like what, how does, how does a really good person differ to someone who's not quite as good at navigating in the, the route selection they make and, and what that, what the impact that has on, on the running? So let's say we have like a easy control. You could run around on a path or you can run over a hill through the terrain. For example, as I said before, a Swedish person maybe would be better to run in the terrain because they're used to run on the terrain. Mm. But on the other side, as a Swiss, you're used to mountains. So probably running up would be good for you too, but maybe not in the terrain. So it makes it like really individual for everybody to really choose your, poss your possibly best route to this control. And yeah, so for me, for example, it was always, um, I rather took the route around, which gives me a bit more like security and easy navigating into the control, which helped me to go fast all the way and don't, do not have to stop. And when we are talking like about navigating orienteering, in orienteering already a mistake by two seconds could be um, decisive. So it's quite small margins we are talking about in elite, elite orienteering. Because what kind of distance is it? would a, a world championships be for example and how many markers would that be yes yeah, so orienteering split in four distances when you talk about elite orienteering we have like the sprint which is like 15 minutes of running and um, the distance is not like set before mm. it's the course setter who decides who, how fast they can or how long they can run in 15 minutes because it depends on if the terrain is steep or if it's like more asphalt or it's grass or you have the forest, how fast is the forest and also how many controls it's not like set before. So that's the core set who is, uh, who is able to choose what he wants to do. The sprint, which is 15 minutes, middle distance, it's 35 minutes, long distance, it's 120 to 140 hours. Normally it could be like between 12 kilometers and like 20, mm. depending on the terrain and women and men, it's a bit different too. And then you have the uh, relays. So it's the sprint relay, which is mixed two women, two men, and the relay, which are, is th with three girls or and three And they men. run together or they tag each other no. and alternate? They go after each other. So it's first one and comes back and then the second comes back. And there it's really even more complicated. So the, the courses are forked. 
So you would not know if the other athletes do have the same controls at the same time. You will know that by the end, because at the end, everybody has the same controls, but not in the same order. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and, and I've noticed when, when you've raced, you always apply a lot of strapping to your ankles. Is it common that, is that just something you've grown up doing or is it common that orienteers just trash their ankles and are falling over lots and is it is it quite injury prone? No, it is not injury prone. Um, but imagine running through the forest um, over every log and stone and everything. Of course, you could like hurt yourself. But um, I twisted my ankles many times i do not have any ligaments left so because of that <laughs> i need to take my feet um but actually not all athletes do tape their feet even in orienteering so probably i would say maybe yeah, it could be about 50 60 percent who is taping them and the other 40 percent do not need that um and we have quite strong ankles so also for myself for trainings I would not always tape my feet just to be able to train the strength too. Mm. So it's like, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably like in trail running because also there, some mm. athletes do tape and some others do not tape their feet. So it's more important to do strength training and to work your feet than taping probably. And, and how much does, how much does it change your speed running through woods, running through? Do you, ha do you know, because when I used to do adventure racing, we'd have an approximate pace that we'd always be running because it'd be like five, six hour races. And you'd know approximately on a bike in this terrain, it would, we'd be this minutes per mile uh, running in this terrain, it'd be this. Do you have that kind of sense in your head of kind of running through woods, running through fern, running through like un uneven grass or? So no, you just have to run as fast as you can all the time. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's where you went wrong, David. That's where you went wrong. Yeah. Just it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, of course you have a sense for how fast you can go because you have always to stay s smart. Mm. If you go too fast, you will get stu uh, really stupid and you will do mistakes. And to find this border, it's like, that's why you train to really in, to make your, like the, to put the limit or the bar a bit higher to have more speed, but do less mistakes. So it's about that to find this rhythm, but that's like just training and you will, in training, you could maybe test something to go a bit faster, to do a bit more like uh, less reading on the map. And, but on, on the competition, of course, it's always the mistakes always happen if you go too fast or too slow because you get like stupid because of the fast, too fast, or you get like bored or your mind is not on the right point because you're too slow. So it's more about the feeling. And I actually never watched, uh, looked at the watch at any point in our interior race. Hmm. And, and in terms of the, like, are there certain techniques that people have for holding maps, for angling maps, for the balance between following just by sight on a map and following the compass, or, or is it always a blend depending on the, the terrain? It's a blend depending on the person, I would say, because everybody has a bit of different technique probably, but you mm. always follow the map in some way and you have a compass on your thumb, um, mostly all of that lead. Some have also some older models, but normally yes. And I mean, you always turn your map to the direction you're running to. I always had my finger where I was, at which point I was to be able to run and then look back on the map to see um, to not have to look or search for the point I'm, I'm at, but it's so different. I can't mm. tell, like if I would meet you and I would like, uh, like to show you orienteering once, um, I would really look how you deal with that at the moment. <laughs> and then we would try to find like a solution to make it easier for you. It is really, it's really strange when you start doing it and 
it's just very, it's not natural for you to run to, and keep looking down while running. Like, it, 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 that's the that's the thing that I think when people start doing it, you literally it feels like you're stopping after every like few meters just to make sure you do it. And so I think you have to kind of get used to it, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And as a kid, for example, they start to do it more like stop and go. So they they look at the map, they run, mm. they stop again, then they look again and then run. And as an elite runner, most of the athletes, they are able to read the map during running through the terrain, through over stones, uh, cliffs and things like that. But some athletes still do like plan their route, for example, standing on the control. So it's really, and some of them, they never stop. So it's really different to find your own um, technique as well. And how does, because in it's, it's, it's uh, one at a time, whereas trail running, you always know where you are in, re in relation to everyone else. You know if you're winning, you can apply pressure to the runners around you. You can, you can impact on their race by your actions. Do, do you think it takes, a, it's a different mentality of, of people that do well in orienteering versus, um, trail running or, or general running because of that? I was actually not thinking about that before. Um, maybe yes, some as in relays, you sometimes know where you're standing at. And mm. also like, sometimes you have like these passages through the public, like through the area where you get to know something from your coach. Um, so you know if you're good or not, but it's still not like you know, not you do not. You have still to navigate many controls, so it can always happen something. Um, but probably, or in cheers, would be like really focused on their self. So except ex, except uh, if you like, if I think trail running for myself, I just go to the start and do whatever I can do, and I'm not thinking much about the others because I can't do anything about their race or how they do it can just change my way how i do something so and maybe a trail runner or a runner probably looks more right to left like and maybe listen less to the to the body probably and just like goes with the flow mm. i don't know it's just i never thought about that before so it's a hard question to answer in terms of it, the, the thing, the other thing I'm interested in is is kind of like the mentality of because you are kind of on your way, but there's so many variables involved, and there's so many things that, like you say, there's literally seconds in it. If if something goes slightly wrong, you kind of know when you know that you're you're behind. Do, is it? I mean, this is going to be a weird question. If if you are having a nightmare, like which I'm sure, <laughs> but yeah, you're having a nightmare, and because I've seen people, I, I, it wasn't on an orienteering course, it was. Um, it was doing a, a a race that you go up a mountain and come back down and it was really um it was really uh, misty and people were getting lost all over the place and people are just giving up and just trying to find their way back Where, do people dnf like or is it just normal to just just push on and complete the course uh, until you've done it because i think that just kind of gives you an idea of the mentality of, of, of what communities like whether they do that or not so it happens that people do DNF, but um, I just remember once at the World Championship in France, it, the first control was like really, really difficult for even for elite or interiors. Many mistakes were made, probably never that much as in this competition before. And the like the girl who should win, Mina Kaupi, a Finnish girl, she was like doing a 20 minute mistake at the first control wow. and she actually did not finish in the end because it was just like she was so given up after that huge mistake and of course with 20 minutes of mistake even in a difficult race you would not win or win or even be top mm. 30 or 40 but she was like really yeah really sad the day after she ran the relay and they were i think they were second or so so she really recovered and put her anger into like focusing more and doing better job. So yeah, it happens, but it's probably more about trying to make a small mistake, trying to really mm. directly act and do something against your insecurity or like, what have I done before and what should I do now? 
that's kind of a strategy which helps in orienteering to really make the small mistakes. Because what would make a control that difficult? So if you imagine a terrain which is like really stony, lots of small hills, which looks the same, yeah. and you have like several small hills beside each other, and it could be like in a, um, what is it called? Like in a hillside, mm. which is like quite steep. So you're just like five meters below the control and you would like think you are at the right spot because it looks exactly the same and the map mm. would almost be right. So yeah, it's really, you re read everything and you try to think where you could be on other point and things like that. But it's like, yeah, it, there are terrains like that. And especially the World Championships in France 2014 was like crazy difficult. Um, it makes it like, just like, yeah. And then of course the nerves are playing with, I mean, mm -hmm. if you start to get like really stressed, of course, everything is just like going wrong and yeah, we are just people. And also there, sometimes you just have a blackout and then what, what should you do? Just and, and how close right? do you need to be to it, to see it? Like what, what does it actually look like? And can, does it change the control? So a control in orienteering is like this red or orange and white flag which is like just 20 centim square centimeters big. Mm. And then there is like the uh, control itself as the SC um, thing on the top. But it's like, it is not, you have to stand beside that, really. Okay. I mean, imagine in the forest, um, you know, like a hole in the forest, you, you really have to run to this hole to see the control. Yeah, okay. So it's not just, um, going through the forest and like looking in 200 meter in front of you and you see the controls or you hear it or whatever it makes no noise so you have really to navigate until this point and and just having that you know it's a certain time rather than a distance does that allow you to almost race and pace more evenly or more precisely because no no so i the times i said was the winner time should be these minutes so it's, of course, you have like to train for kind of 35 minutes, mm. but sometimes it could be 30 minutes because the, the course setter was like really mistaking it in times, or it could be 40 minutes. So no, it doesn't help to pace anything. So as before, it's more about like your feeling and mm. trying to really be in your moment and try to push at every second. And then hopefully you will be able to push all the time. Yeah. So then coming to your five world championships um what what you know what made you stay good at those and what can you were there any kind of standout moments of, of why you thought you won it and, and that felt really special yeah it's always hard if i have to tell like these special moments or kind of things for me it's like more about these yeah things i had to the possibility to enjoy or to really get to know myself too, because there were lots of up and downs. For example, in Scotland, UK, 2017, I had like my worst year or worst world championships. And it was like, even there, it's like something I've learned a lot or like there are lots of things I've learned and I'm really grateful for these moments. But for example, like in, to win the World Championship Sprint in Venice, at, in the city, it's quite special for an orienteer to run Sprint in Venice as first, and then mm. also to win the race there. It was really nice having my yeah, family there. Very cool. Yeah. Or 2018 it was, um, having my daughter, my bigger daughter, at the finish line after being at the hospital for one week during World Championships, for example. It's like these moments which I remember the most and which are really important for myself. And what, were you at the hospital for yourself? Or was no, that she was at the Lynn? hospital. Oh no. oh no, honestly, her daughter's so adorable, Jodie. Um, <laughs> oh no, Is she, was she right? Yeah, yeah, she had a bronchitis. Um, it started when we were in Riga at the first, after the first qualification. So we went to the hospital and I was actually also sleeping at the hospital from time to time and racing or going to training and back and front. Wow. So yeah, it was a tough week. I won three medals actually. Um, I was really proud, but the last race, I totally, yeah, blow up 
and yeah, yeah, because of the hard week it has been. You're allowed to. You're allowed yeah. to do that. That's fine. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> and what Thanks. happened? What happened in Scotland? <laughs> yeah, I was injured back then, so um, I had problems with the uh, the vertebra, which made that my left leg was not moving normally, so I was not able to lift it anymore. I thought I was able to like push all through, but I lost um, a final shoot sprint against the Russian girl. Um, so we got fourth in a sprint relay, which we have should have won. They're probably dating as well. I, so, I was going to you say, you'll probably, you'll probably get the bronze in a couple of years anyway. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, yeah, and after that, I was not able to race anymore. So I had to stop that and really, yeah, it was hard. It was a lot of media attend up, uh, at this week. So I was always in focus. I, everybody was ex expecting me to win and um, not being able to run um, was like really, yeah, it was hard. But we, the holidays after the World Championships, they were beautiful in the, uh, in the Highlands. So yeah, I remember that the more. And, and you know, as, as a really top level um, orienteer, is it similar in, in kind of status, in terms of sponsorship, kind of financial support as trail running? Like, are, you, are there many athletes who are able to be full-time orienteers in the world? So orienteering is still a small um, sport as trail running is too. And also money-wise, you don't get lots of um, prize money, for example, or no sport starting money. So of course, it's not like this job where you earn a lot of money. But um, some athletes are able to to make their salary to just like run and work with partners. And I had actually the possibility to just work a little hours or if I want to work, I can work like 40%. But I have partners in the last years to be able to focus on orienteering. I would say it's it's getting more and more athletes who focus just on orienteering and they're able to to do it while they're on tears, but they will probably need to go back to work after their career as an orienteer. They will not be like um, just, yeah, mm. orienteers, or they can't live on their salary for the whole life. And um, during that stage, those kind of five year, those five times, how did you, when you were looking across at trail running, what were your thoughts of it as a sport and, and of the athletes who were who are doing well in that? So I've always loved running and for me, trail running has always been a part of my training. As I said, like running is the most important part for, for orienteering. So as an orienteer, you would always love to do races, but as we have week, every weekend would be like orienteering race. You don't have time to go to a trail running race. Mm. So I had like this, I want to do that and I want to go there and like, and yeah. That's why I was like really keen to check if or to see if I can do that when I stop orienteering. And that's why probably also many like Fredo, for example, tries to do some mm. orienteering race, eh, trail running races from time to time because he just lo loves to do that as well as Tuve Alexanderson, for example, the best orienteer from Sweden also does some races just like because you want to do some mountain races too. And I was actually going to, I was going to mention it to you, babe, because my, my only experience of her was watching the footage before the Golden Trail, where she came out to, was it South Africa? Um, absolutely buried herself, like blitz the first day. And, and then almost couldn't walk after that because she'd, she'd just given so much. Um, they, they talked about how you had this great rivalry in the footage, which... Is is that a true rivalry? Was that just what they were saying to try and create more of a narrative for the Golden Trail? So Tuve, she is way younger than I am, but she has been competing internationally since she was a junior in orienteering. So she has always been like the star in orienteering and everybody would expect from her to be like the best in some years. And she is. So. She is just an amazing athlete. She does her work. She trains a lot. She focuses totally on orienteering, which is not really my life. So we are really different 
as an as a person but we we i really like her as a person too so it's really interesting to find like these totally different lives like hers and mine but still being on almost on the same level level i would say she's maybe a bit higher than i am but like being almost on the same level level as an athlete but doing totally different things and that's that's thing which i think is really interesting and which i really like to see because also as a young athlete you should see these different lives which always all leading to like good or fun races so yeah it was really i think it's they put it more as like a rivalry but for me it was more a friendship and like really nice fights we had in orienteering and and is sweden switzerland are they the, the kind of big two are they the big rivalries are they the kind of Russia or America of, of orienteering? Yeah, yeah, probably yes. But then, I mean, there are different uh, countries as well. So, for example, also Finland, Norway, they do have a lot of good athletes. Denmark in the women's at least, Russia or Czech Republic, for example. So there are lots of different um, countries. Um, also, New Zealand had the sprint bronze medalist last year for example and like so but Sweden and Switzerland they try to be the best national team and of course there is a big like work uh, yeah fight between them but as I been living in Sweden for f four years almost Sweden is more like my second home so it, I really really like mm. to to speak Swedish, to be with Swedish people. So for me, it's just friendship and nothing else. It makes me wonder whether Swaziland would be great at orienteering as well. It's all the SWs, isn't it? Because they can be African <laughs> champions. Sweden, Sweden. Drag them out. Um, so when, when did them, what made you decide? Because you, you've won five world champs. And um, when did you then decide actually now is the time to venture into trail running a bit more so i stopped um orienteering in 2018 after having after, one year after having my first girl um lynn it was one year um just like with um sorry uh, with a lot of um, <laughs> i had to give my husband something for the kids oh, sorry. um no so 2018 18 <laughs> <Hey Gabriel>. was, <laughs> 2018 was my last year it was really complicated to fit everything together orienteering and kit and traveling mm. so i was like just for me it was really perfect to stop my career as orienteer there but then it was really easy to just say mm. i will do some few races in 2019 just to to see what I want to like, to see where I can go in trail running, but not to travel far. So, for example, my first race was in Kanase, which is quite close to Switzerland. We did holidays in a tent, for example, just the week before with our girl, um, not really preparing kind of for the race, but just going there to, to have fun. And it's the way I, I live trail running now as well. So just do a few races, not traveling too much if I can, and just to enjoy what I like to run in the mountains. And so when when you then, because I'm trying to remember what your first Golden Trail win was, was that Dolomith's run? Or was that... Yeah. Yeah. So um, how cause how technical is, because Dolomith, from my understanding, was the most technical run of the series last year. Um, how How would that compare with orienteering runs, orienteering races? So, especially downhill in Dolomit, it's, it's really technical because you have like these loose stones in a steep downhill. Mm. And it would be really hard for athletes to know where you can stand and you have to really be focused all the way in the downhill. And it's 2000 meter downhill. So it's quite a lot um, and quite a lot of time which you have to be totally focused. Um, if you compare it to orienteering, you would never run downhill for 2000 meters, but mm. like kind of being focused all the time, that's quite similar because if you lose the focus in orienteering, you will fall or you will lose or you will do a mistake. So kind of that in this sense, it's really similar, 
but it's not really the technique which is the same. And and did you did you have to prepare your legs, your kind of your quads and things like that for such a, a trashing, or were you naturally strong enough? I actually didn't prepare much before this race um, in 2019. I was just otherwise like in a really good shape, but yeah, and we are used to run up and down a lot, so. Yeah, I was really surprised how well I could absorb the shock in this race, actually. Um, but probably it would be good if you really focus on preparing your legs, if you do that the first time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so when you when you first did that race then, um, I mean, how, how did you find that race compared to orienteering? I really enjoyed doing something different. Um, running 2,000 meter uphill meters just on on one one go, it was like really tough. But I enjoyed just to run with another girl or with um, Ruth Croft back then, mm. and it was just like seeing how far I can go. I was not putting any pressure on myself to need like being that I have to be top 10 or things like that. So it was really, it was really fun to just like do whatever I do and to see where I can go. And that's probably why it worked so well in the end. And cause I mean, in the race, you, you were kind of second, third at the top and you managed to absolutely kind of slice through the downhill. And I don't think Maud even knew you'd overtaken her because you'd, you'd taken such an aggressive route that she was out of sight as you went past her almost. Um, I mean, what was, uh, how, how did you make that decision to, to just cut across all the, the trails? Is that something you knew was possible or did, was that instinct? No, no, it's, um, I was looking at that exactly at this point the day before, um, because, mm another athlete on he tell, told me that there you have to take the shortcut so i was actually going there and just seeing where i have to take this shortcut you could also do shortcuts before but they're probably not that important like this one so actually also in the evening when we ate pizza the day before i told Maud where she should do the shortcut and i showed her photos because she was not able to go there um, because mm. I didn't want to, I didn't want to have some advantage to her, but she somehow couldn't react. She didn't, um, it was not enough to see this picture or she even didn't mm. believe she could do this shortcut. I don't know. So she didn't do it, even though I was telling her that. And then, um, yeah, it was kind of like, I was not thinking anything more than just running my own race and running downhill and I actually I'm not thinking that I'm a good r downhill runner so I know all do think that but um, if you know orienteers like Tuve Alexanderson or some other Swiss runners they're way better in downhill than I am so it's quite fun for me that people were like telling me that <laughs> oh, you were so good at downhill but I was like yeah I'm okay but you know they're way better girls than I am so it was quite fun yeah and and, the, and secondly, it's like when you get into the flow of downhill running, you will just be so much in your own, um, like your own strat, like you just do whatever you have to do. And it's like, you don't yeah. think you're just in a flow. And that's what happened back then, which not really happened last year, actually, because I never got into this flow. So it also shows how much like, you have to believe in yourself, like in your abilities, not that you are fast, but just that you can do that. And then you will get into this flow to really be focused in the moment. And, and how did that victory kind of, well, firstly, is, is, the, is the crowd similar at orienteering to, to trail running? Is it a similar kind of energy? Is it different because everyone there is truly an orienteer and competing or? It's hard to tell. I mean, orienteering, you normally are quite a lot of the time on your own in the forest. And then you have like some few um, moments which are like with, spectac um, with um, people watching you when you pass the area, for example. So it's kind of the same, but still not the same. 
and it's hard to tell. Um, but they're all like really happy and really supportive. So this would be like the same. And in in Italy and Ghana, say the people would be more like around the finish. So also there, it's not too much on the route. And I'm not really mm. the person who who suck who really knows much about the spectators. They I just I like run imagine. and sometimes see my family, but not the others. Yeah, I can't imagine it's a, a very good spectator sport. It's like it, it just very difficult to it must be to keep track of where people are or you know because it's so spread out in the forest and just like the at the end must be like the only point at which everyone knows where everyone is yeah but normally in world championships you always have like an area passage so you would do the course that people would run or like the athletes would run some minutes for example and then they come back to the spectators go again and then come oh, to the finish okay. so and ah. then we're always wearing GPS trackers, so they will show the map with the GPS trackers and they have like many cameras in the forest to really make orienteering as a spectator. Mm -hmm. um, you would, you should watch the, the World Championships th this year. It would be fun for you, I think. Yeah. They will be live broadcasted on the internet at, at IOF. When is it? That's quite soon, is it? Um, it's in July. Yeah. And um, and and how did it feel to win um a Dolimus run compared to well the the Orientine World Champs? Did it did it feel like more special in a way because it wasn't your your native sport? <laughs> it was fun. I really enjoyed um winning there, but it was not like more than that it was just like it was so nice running in these mountains and i enjoyed that so much but i mean yeah life was going on after that too i was um it was really fun having my girl and my husband in a finish so of course um changing diapers after the finish was maybe more important <laughs> than my win so <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> is that is that your I husband mean, or so the baby fun. which one <laughs> <laughs> you can it's up to you dude <laughs> no but i mean for me oh like now of course i was always like when i'm st at the starting line i try to be as the best as i can or i try to do the best i have in my body at that time but on the other hand it's like there are so much more important things in life which are going on so it's more this is really like kind of more important for my myself in the end so yeah <laughs> now um i'd love to because i'm just conscious of time um especially because you're an hour late i'd love to actually because in my head i'd love to talk speak for like another 50 minutes and just talk about uh, nepal to talk about um you know what happened last year talk about your current injury all those things um but w would it be, would it make more sense for us to kind of almost finish finished it at like an end of a transition into trail and, and then do a potential future episode in in the future or um how are you for time um i mean doesn't matter <laughs> yeah i'm uh, i mean the girls sleep are sleeping but they will wake up tomorrow early so <laughs> it depends how much hours of sleep you will give me <laughs> well should we because this is quite a nice one we've had the first one into trail and then if, if you're happy to, I'd love to do another episode of you where we yeah. can kind of discuss the last three years or so since you've, you've transitioned to child, just to get your re a real understanding into how the seasons have been, um, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Amazing. Well, um, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. If, if people want to follow you on social media, if they want to, um, to, to see how you're progressing and other things, what's the base, best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, I try to do social media on Instagram. <laughs> no, um, you will find me on uh, at Judith Wieder um, or Facebook sometimes. Um, as I said, there are lots of other things which are important at life, so I try to do that. <laughs> and uh, I would just like the, the happiest I would be to meet them in person at some trail races in future or in the mountains. So they just should say hi and and um, yeah, I will stop and say hi to 
Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Judith. Um, congratulations on five world titles, the Golden Trail Series, and um, hopefully we'll be catching up with, soon, with you soon. But if not, hopefully I'll be catching up with you sometime this season. Fingers crossed. So good luck with the injury until then. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thanks, Judith. <laughs> It's really weird because we, we kind of press stop for the recording because of the new technology and then we, we go to do our, our catch up after of, of the discussion and we forget that then there's a six second countdown which and it's really six, breaks up the, uh, the flow. It's six seconds. It doesn't make... Why is it six seconds and not five? Like, or ten? <laughs> like, why, why six? What's so special about six? Yeah. Six seconds is a long, a long time when everyone's... You've just pressed record and then you end sit there. <laughs> Six. I mean, we can do six seconds of silence three. to show you how weird it is. It's three. We just see you going to sit in awkwardness, like going, uh, 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 and this is what I want to say. <laughs> six seconds is a long time but, in broadcast, um, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, not on this podcast. Christ, <laughs> the amount of time we go into. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I thought that was, that was quite a good time to end it just because um, I was aware that Judith's in Switzerland, which is at least 10 o'clock, maybe even later. Um, but also... There's, um, you know, this, this, this very much is part one because she has um, her, her, her role in, in Golden Trail from that moment on has been so interesting. Um, and she's, she's been such a great athlete, but also has, has had to deal with uh, a lot um, in terms of injuries, things that um, I'd really like to have got into a bit more depth. But um, Jodie, you can do that orienteering now. You signed up. See, the thing is, oh, the, the, this was, I, I thought was quite interesting is that orienteering seems to be in a place and i don't know whether this entirely but but just from my in terms of it it seems to be in the place that ultra running was 10 years ago like it, like you if you try and find something about it you go to a like a website which is filled with broken links uh, uh you're trying to find events <laughs> and it's just you know, things asking for payment and you're thinking is this still even valid and it's got something from like 2011 on it or whatever it it just it has that element of Someone set this up, but they don't really spend much time on the internet, and so they yeah. don't really maintain the web page, and they probably just got their local group, and they they kind of so it all feels really, really kind of amateur, and uh, you know, but because even the even finding the permanent courses, um, you look at like the British Orienteering site, and then you go break down into the different counties and things like that. And like half of the permanent courses on there, are, you know, are either shut or it says, you know, here's the permanent course, here's the map. Um, but good luck mm. if you if if you still think, you know, that there's going to be some um, some controls yeah, left. There. So it's them. exactly so it 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 doesn't feel at the moment as though it, it's really clear like what the kind of like the pathway is in order to do it. And I remember because I, I have done one. I uh, know I've done two orienteering courses. I did one which was just in a kind of park. Which um, do you know who I did it with? Mm. I did it with um, Rob Shenton. He came and uh, he just after oh, yeah. the after the MDS, he came because it was right next to where we lived, and, uh, and that, he introduced me to like my first orienteering thing. Um, and then the second one I did for for men's running um, for uh, just to, to kind of see what it was like, and it was in the Surrey Hills, and it was probably the hardest entry point to an orienteering course you can imagine because it was like right on like right on the uh, newlands corner i think it's called um and it was really steep and you get went into guildford or wherever it is near there yeah it was it was quite so those are my two but uh, the idea of my daughter was a seven-year-old running around a forest navigating herself is utterly frightening um but i think oh, I, I think that's I, delightful i love oh that i think idea. it is delightful i i i but but i don't it seems to me like orienteering would almost be like the perfect thing for children to learn the perfect thing because yeah. it yeah, it absolutely. tricks them into running in the way that geocaching tricks my children into walking um and so it, <laughs> it, and it's true because you're, you're you're concentrating and you're moving and yeah, yeah, it seems to be like a really. But also it's decision making as well. You, yeah, you've really got to make I... independent decisions. That's why I'm bad at it because I can never decide anything. Like you say, oh, do I go that way? And it's so. It, from from what you were saying, that from what Judith was saying, that it's so individual. Like there is no right right route. The mm -hmm. route 
may be right for you mm. or it or it won't and so there just seems to be so many variables involved um that i think that's what makes it that makes yeah. it really interesting how you could do the you know and that's not even we're not even like bringing in the environmental factors as well um that that, that may play a part in terms of like you know the, the weather mist all that all those other things so yeah. so i i do actually want to watch it i could i would never have thought it was a spectator sport in any way so the idea of watching people do orienteering is is utterly bizarre, but I'm intrigued now. Honestly, go and go and see the the Golden Trail World Championships. Uh, sorry, the Golden Trail. What do they call it? When so last year they had a in, two years ago instead of having a series, they had a, a, a long weekend of, of four races. Go and watch Toby Alexander do downhill running in that, and she's like a she's like a possessed possessed running beast it's just incredible <laughs> i almost fell in love with the way she ran she's just so ferocious the way she throws herself around the course and um yeah i can imagine seeing her doing orienteering well would, would be incredible um but it, it's it's almost seems a shame that if the route into orienteering here seems to be adventure racing or the om and like two things where like quest stars it's like six hours <laughs> or, <the> <laughs> or a weekend of being on a mountain <laughs> That's the thing. I, mean, I know I there's, I, there's, there's, it... because the thing is, it's it's such an easy thing to set up. Like it's a bunch of like little control. So I I remember looking at this in Runners World, and and they had them at various, but they were at various like school fields and stuff. So they're not going to be the most complicated mm. of things. And it's just getting used to going to the to un, I suppose you know just learning the um the sort of the key and i'm using all the wrong terminology but but in using you know knowing how to do the route and things like that and so it was kind of like i suppose those was for kind there's of there's no beginners. reason why every place of a park run though couldn't have a, a route i know and that's the thing what that's what i don't understand all they are all you have yeah is basically just the little squares and you just have to it's it's like you could turn yeah. literally every park into a permanent orienteering course and it seems like it's like the and easiest, quickest thing. And you could probably do it with thing. QR codes now. Yeah, yeah, just absolutely. QR codes in Hyde Park, Regent's Park, all those things. You do a different order depending on the month or whatever it was, and, and people could. Yeah, you'd, you'd think that would be super simple. Um, well, do balance. Is, is anyone else inspired to do orienteering? Has anyone tried it? I know that the um, there's an organisation in South London called South London Orienteering Wayfarers Team Slow because I they were my great rivals in. Um, <laughs> In the night, everyone's your great rivals. I think Every, they do quite a few of it. Everyone's somewhat <laughs> have been your great rival. It doesn't matter what sport they're in, they were your great rival in something else. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Dragon Boat Absolutely, Rowing Team. They yes. were my great, ri great rivals in darts. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you heard about it? Obviously. <laughs> I mean, that's how big, strong the rivalry was. But that, um, but um, yeah, and because I. I, I do like the idea of orienteering and I love the idea of, of being able to go to parks as well and just instead of just going for a run for a 5k just picking up an app or picking up a piece of paper and actually doing something a little bit more involved um, and I can see for kids it would be super fun and just complete unique experiences but yeah let's let me think we'll um we'll ask Judith to come back on again and do a part two so any questions you've got for her the message message us letters or david at badboyrunning.com if you like this episode um we've we've had francesco puppy talking talking um, about gone trail and he comes at it from a very different angle he was um predominantly a road marathoner and he's uh, he's then kind of used that speed and brought it to to gone trail nikki nikki brinkman as well who recently broke the dutch record for the marathon in a second ever marathon 222 insane um, she joined Golden Trail last season and having been a hockey player, decided to train at running in lockdown, is now one of the best marathon runners in the world and did Golden Trail last season and is doing Golden Trail racing in a week's time in Zagaba. Um, any episodes you can think of, Jodie, that would link in? I've stolen them all from you. So Yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, can't, I can't think of, uh, in terms of um, thinking about like technical... Um... I, don't, I can't think of one, not off the top of my head. And we we have we have spoken to um, we did speak to the organisers of the OM as well. Can't remember who we spoke to from that. So apologies 
if that is you. But um, yeah, if you want to, to know about that, about mountain running and navigation, then that's a good one. Well, thanks for listening, guys. We'll be back next week. And uh, please do rate and review us because it really helps us get guests. If you've got any suggestions of future guests, you can email me d- again, david at babylon.com. We'll go out there and get them. And uh, you want to, uh, to uh, join the conversation? Oh, yeah, if you want to join the conversation, head over to Facebook community, you answer three questions, and uh, we'll let you in. You can uh, d- desecrate a poll or something like that. Um, and Are we uh, if you Facebook want... community now, rather than Facebook group, is that a new? Oh, a community. Is that a new... Are you trying community. to That's smooth our way. Over That's the... our way of trying to like get into an awards, get, try, win awards for our community. That kind of thing. In communities, get grants. Facebook groups <laughs> don't. <We're... laughs> so, yeah. Um, I mean, so fair, yes, I, we're never winning awards or community or grants for our community. <laughs> that is for sure. Aren't we? Aren't we, David? Aren't we? Um, <laughs> It feels like some embezzle. I sound like I'm going to embezzle some money from someone. I don't mean to do, like do that at all. I just it, it, the thing is because we've come back from um, doing the running show and people go, "What's bad boy running?" We always say community. We don't go, "Oh, it's a podcast and a Facebook group," because uh, it makes it sound like we always say, "Oh, it's a community" <laughs> or, or things like that, just to make it sound like yeah, more than it is. Um, yeah. So if you want to uh, be part of the community and look like you're part of the community, you can head to um, store.badboyrunning.com and um, purchase some of the wonderful merch that we've got there as well. Amazing. Well, thanks for listening, guys. And we'll see you next time. See you later. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-b